Hi everybody, welcome back to my channel. In this video I'm going to try and make a male portrait that has a little bit of a fantasy flavor to it, and I'm going to try and make it without using a photo reference so that I can practice structuring faces. I feel I need to develop more confidence in drawing faces without relying too much on photographs so that I can understand the physiology and anatomy of heads and facial features rather than just copying them from images. I'm hoping to be able to provide additional details to my methodology here as I begin structuring the shapes that will make the head. Again, you might see the side of my head peeking through, just like in other videos. I think at one point you'll even see the camera wobble, so I'm really, really sorry about that. But as the video continues, I managed to get the camera stable, so um, fingers crossed there. As you can see in the beginnings of my shape making, I was trying to use the standard method of blocking shapes to create the base. And then I used lines and ratios to align facial features. As this young man's face is tilted sideways and is also at a three quarters angle looking over his shoulder, I'm pretty sure that there are some features that didn't really come out right. Um, I don't feel like his lips align with his nose, but I'm pretty sure that his nose does align relatively well to his eyes. But I'm not really sure if that's the actual angle that it should be, or perhaps it should be jutting out a little bit more. Likewise, his little unicorn horn might not be angled in the correct way. Likewise, I think the tilt of my camera is currently making the lower half of my unicorn boy's face look a little bit larger in the bottom than it is at the top, making his chin jut and look a little bit too big proportionately to the rest of his face. I believe that's just the way I've currently angled the camera, and later on throughout the video I do actually manage to fix that and tilt the camera so that the image is a lot more squared. Now this character that I'm drawing is somebody I've actually drawn before. I don't really have a name for him yet, so I've just been calling him Unicorn Boy for several years. I got inspired to create him around three or four years ago after the whole trend of uh, drawing soft watercolored characters and images with galaxy and starry night motifs became really, really popular on the internet. Likewise, I was using him as a way to practice drawing male faces, and after a while I really just liked the idea of this lovely young unicorn man generally. I've drawn him in different ways, and I don't know, some of my older images actually look really, really good, whereas more recent ones don't seem to do it for me. I don't know if it is a regression of my drawing skills or my obsession with getting his face right is causing me to make more stylistic mistakes than I'd like. I think because I've been drawing so many things from photos, I've also lost the ability in shaping faces on my own, which is why I decided to do this practice. I guess the only thing I can do then is practice, practice, and practice. Now here, I'm already getting started on my watercoloring. With this painting, I wanted to get uh, used to a technique called glazing, in which you use soft translucent washes of colors to build up the color and texture of the painting. In this particular case, I actually wanted to use different colors that are glazed on top of each other to create a specific tone and texture. I used uh, in this one soft washes of various shades of blue, lilac, and even some reddish purples, probably not yet at this stage, but there is quite a bit of purple in the darker shades of the face, um, so that I could create a skin tone that had a slight galaxy swirly kind of tone to it. I don't know if that's going to make sense, but hopefully as I keep painting it's going to actually work out, so fingers crossed. Now, I'd like to share with you some history and mythology notes that helped inspire me to make this unicorn boy in the first place. Unicorns are a widely discussed and ancient mythical creature, noted down in many traditions across the world. It's believed that the earliest descriptions and depictions have been seen and mentioned as far back as the Indus Valley civilization, which existed nearly 5,000 years ago. They were also depicted in some form in Mesopotamia, and then was later first described in a book by the Greek historian and physician Ctesias in the 5th century BC. In his book, which depicted his travels throughout Persian India, he describes a creature with the head of a stag, the feet of an elephant, the body of a horse, and a huge horn in the middle of his forehead. The creature mentioned is called a monokeros, which means mono, one, keros, horn. And it's likely that what Ctesias was describing was several different animals with similar features, namely an oryx, which is a kind of antelope or horned deer of some sort, and most likely a rhinoceros. The unicorn was also allegedly mentioned in the Bible, as some translations of the Hebrew word re'em were misunderstood to mean unicorn. 
and it's more likely that the animal again was probably a wild ox or an aurochs. Nevertheless, the legend of the unicorn continued to grow, and by the Middle Ages, the myth turned the unicorn into a steed with the head of a goat, the body of a horse, and the tail of a lion, and of course, the long spiral horn coming out from the top of its head. A later Greek bestiary of the 2nd or 3rd century called the Physiologus described the unicorn as being a fierce creature capable of killing an elephant. It was so wild and fierce that the only way to effectively subdue it was to lure it using a young virgin maiden. The unicorn would then be calmed and would place his head on her lap and suckle from her breast and thus be calmed enough to be killed for its horn. Now, at this point in the painting, I started working on the contour and shape of the face outside of just the shading. As you can see, I use really, really watery washes that basically just dry into nothing. I mainly did this because I was worried um, about over-concentrating the color as I normally do when working with watercolors. I then started to glaze over the contours of the face using more of these magenta shaded purples to create that swirly galaxy tone that I was talking about before. Once I felt more confident, I actually got a bit bold. I added a few glazes of emerald green because the color wasn't as strong and it actually complemented the purple once it dried and it didn't turn out as muddy as I had feared that it would get. Now, back to the mythology of unicorns. The strange legend about the weirdly seductive way to hunt a unicorn for its horn actually created the now commonly known iconography of white unicorns prancing about with pretty young medieval ladies. In fact, there's a very famous Belgian tapestry from the 14th century called La Dame à la Licorne, done in the famous Flemish weaving style of the time. It's actually a beautiful set of six vibrant tapestries depicting several ladies cavorting around with a unicorn and hanging out with his buddies, which happens to be a lion and sometimes there's also a monkey. It's supposed to depict an allegory of the five senses and then the sixth tapestry is supposed to be an obscure symbolic allegory about desire. Unicorn hunts became thematic in medieval and renaissance Europe because of the way they prized the unicorn horn. A unicorn's horn was believed to have magic curative properties. Its horn could purify water and heal diseases, as well as dispel poison, and therefore was sought out by the powerful and wealthy. As a result, there was an explosion of trade in unicorn horn artifacts, including powders, chalices, and fake horns. Normally, these items were made from rhino horn, or more commonly, narwhal horn, which is where we get the famous look of the spiral horn in particular. They were used to detect poison in drinks and were so lucrative that the famous De Medici family of Florence owned a unicorn horn worth a whopping 6,000 gold coins, which is like, I guess, millions of dollars in street value these days, I guess. Except for the fact that, of course, it wasn't real. In fact, it was so normally believed that unicorns were real, and the use of unicorn horn was so common and so established, the only suspicions people had about them was whether the items were made of real unicorn horn or not. Not once during that time did anybody assume that maybe, just maybe, unicorns themselves did not exist at all. Then, in the 16th century, a French royal doctor and surgeon, Ambroise Paré, one day wrote an essay saying that he didn't believe unicorn horn cures were particularly effective. This brought him in huge disrepute among other doctors who demanded that he retract his essay. Instead, like a badass, he went one further and stated that he didn't think unicorn horn cures worked because, shock and horror, unicorns weren't even real in the first place. Unicorns aren't just known in the West. Marco Polo also mentioned in his travel journals that he saw a unicorn. Now, we know that what he was actually describing was also a rhinoceros, just like with many others, but there are legends of horned, horse-like creatures in the Far East. These are mainly known in China as the Chilin or Kirin, as we know from the famous Japanese beer. But in terms of description, these creatures have two horns on their head instead of one, but generally they're still referred to as being Asian unicorns. Now, as I finish up on the background and the rest of this image, I'm using complementary colors to keep that soft, dreamy look to the picture. 
To provide contrast, I used a greener, more aquamarine-based uh, blue tint so that my unicorn boy's face wouldn't blend in too much with the background. So far, I feel like I have been more restrained in my use of pigment than usual, and I worked really hard to keep that soft look. As I built the cloudy shapes of the background, I also chose to emphasize some darker shades along the side of his face in particular to help sharpen that profile. And then I worked on putting little stars and constellations to freckle his face using white gouache. Well, now that I'm finishing up here, I want to thank you all again for watching and I hope that you learned something alongside with me. As usual, there's still so much more that I need to learn and improve on, but overall I'm happy with the result of this one and I'm looking forward to trying other similar things in the future. Please don't forget to leave a comment or a question if you've got one, forward my video to your friends if you think they'll enjoy these types of things, and um, please uh, feel free to like and subscribe once you've watched. Thank you again for all your support, and I really hope to be able to provide another fun video in the next one, and I'll see you next time. Bye!